<clears throat> All right. Um, thank you for joining our fireside chat with Alex Kotlowitz and Mary Smeek. Uh, I'm Patrick, the Adult Services Manager at Westchester Public Library. Uh, I want to thank the 56 Rails libraries who partnered with us to make this event possible. Uh, I want to thank my programming team here at Westchester, Chris, Ryan, Lisa, and our director, Fidencio. And I also want to recognize Rachel and Donna at LaSalle Public Library for being our Zoom co-hosts this evening. Uh, a quick note about Zoom. When this event ends, Zoom will prompt you to answer a quick survey question. Uh, what library did you register through? Uh, we ask that you please take a moment to answer that question when prompted. Um, now I'm going to introduce Alex Kotlitz and Mary Smeek. Um, called one of our great American journalists by Ta-Nehisi Coates, Best-selling author Alex Kotlowitz is recognized for his unflinching portrayals of race and poverty in America. For more than three decades, he has brought his trademark empathy and on-the-ground reporting to many forms of media, most notably his two nonfiction classics, There Are No Children Here and The Other Side of the River. His latest book, An American Summer, is a spellbinding collection of profoundly intimate profiles of people and communities affected by gun violence. He also partnered with Hoop Dreams director and producer Steve James on the Emmy award-winning documentary, The Interrupters. Alex Kotlowitz is a regular contributor to This American Life, The New York Times Magazine, and The New Yorker, and he teaches journalism at Northwestern University. Um, Mary Smeek is our guest moderator tonight. Um, she is a nationally syndicated columnist and a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Yeah. She wrote the comic strip Brenda Starr, Reporter, from 1985 to its conclusion in 2011, and has hosted Songs of Good Cheer with Eric Zorn since 1999. She has two books, Wear Sunscreen, and Even the Terrible Things Seem Beautiful. We will be sharing links to where you can buy both Alex and Mary's books in the Zoom chat uh, momentarily. Um, so uh, now Alex and Mary are gonna have their fireside chat and I'm gonna turn off my video and uh, rejoin before we close the event to ask some questions submitted by the audience. Okay, Alex, I think it's just you and me now. I guess by our fireside. It's uh, great, great to see you in the, the Zoom venue. Um, the description of this was that we were going to have a wide ranging conversation, and we are. Um, but before we get to the big topics, you know, the, the important things you write about, I want to do Alex Kotlowitz, the prequel, by talking to you just a little bit about where you came from. You grew up in New York City. Just, I did. Yeah. Tell me about how you got from the Upper West Side of New York City to Chicago and to these topics that have been your life's work. Yeah, so I grew up in uh, in New York on, on the West Side, and the and uh, and I came of age in the 1960s there, um, and uh, it was a very different place than it is now. It was a very mixed community. I spent a lot of time, most of my weekends, I spent playing basketball. Um, and so, you know, I lived in this incredibly diverse universe growing up, and I assumed that everybody lived like that. And of course, once I got out of New York, I came to realize in some ways how exceptional an experience that was. Um, I also grew up in a household my, where I think I got the best of both parents. You know, my father was a writer. He was a novelist. Um, and uh, books were ever present in our apartment. Uh, and my mom was a social worker, uh, deeply political. I remember her dragging me off to the Bryant Park anti-war rally in 1968 or 69. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I left New York to go to college and I've never been back uh, to live. Um, I, I feel in some way, I landed in the Midwest really in large part by accident. You know, I ended up getting a job at a small alternative newspaper and. Lansing, Michigan. Um, and I think my temperament is more Midwestern than it is Eastern. Um, what does that mean? Well, I, there's a kind of um, openness about the Midwest and uh, kind of people are kind of even keeled. Um, I don't want to uh, be Pollyannish about this because I mean, all the fissures you 
find in the American landscape. You'll find not only in the Midwest, you'll find just within the confines of our city. Um, but but I just, I love, and I love the pace of the Midwest as well. Um, and so I ended up working, you know, at this alternative paper. I uh, took a job at the Wall Street Journal in Chicago. That was back in 1984. And I've been here ever since. This is, I consider this my home. Um, uh, and so at, at, at what point did you land on, you know, what I think of as your life's work, which is interrogating, trying to fathom poverty, violence, trauma, these things, segregation that, that are so much the foundation of this place? Yeah. So when I moved to Chicago um, and took a job at the Wall Street Journal, I, I didn't think I'd be there but a couple of years. I, I was not inclined to write bit about business, but one of the things I quickly learned at the paper is I was able to carve out a niche for myself and write about the very things I'm still writing about today. And I ended up spending 10 years there. But I remember in, it was 1980, uh, 85, and I, um, there was a report that had come out by the Children's Defense Fund that indicated that one out of every five children were growing up in, in poverty, and there was a great to do about it. And I had a, an experience, I had dropped out of school for a while and had worked as a community organizer on the south side of Atlanta. Uh, this is back in the mid 70s at, uh, in what was then the second poorest census tract in the country, uh, second only to Watts in LA. And, uh, and I thought I was pretty savvy about life in our, our central cities. And I was really sort of upended by that experience, by the kind of profound poverty and also the, the deep racism that uh, the, the people that I spent time with experience. And, and that, that, that those eight months I wasn't aware of at the time were transformative. And so, when I was in Chicago and this report came out, I had a, my first inclination was to go back down, go down to Atlanta and, and find some of the kids I had worked with. And it wasn't practically possible. So I did the next best thing, which was to go and spend time in a public housing project in the city. It was my first time in public housing. And again, I was completely upended. And I've got to say, if I'm being honest, I remember my first day there, I felt this deep sense of shame. Like, how, how could I not know? I mean, here, I, these projects were just a mile and a half from my office then downtown. Um, and that sense of shame quickly turned to anger. And I think much of my writing, though not all of it, but much of it stems from a sense of, of anger and or indignant fury. Um, you know, I always used to think, I mean, our friend Studs, you know, always used to say, Studs Trickle used to say, you know, if the community isn't doing all right, neither am I. And I feel like that's kind of what drives my work um, that you, uh, so. so you have this, you know, you, you've developed over the years this, this sense of, of anger and dedication, you know, all the emotions that go into this, but there's also the practical elements of finding your stories. Right. So, so talk to me, I mean, you know, not every individual works as an illumination of the larger story. How, how do you find your people? Yeah, and I want to say before I say that, because you talk about my anger and I'm not a very angry person by nature, but one of the challenges as a writer, and Mary, you know this as well as I do, is when you sit down to put pen to paper, you gotta put that anger aside because right. the challenge is, you don't- I use that word because you did, you know? Right, no, 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 I, I, no, I appreciate it. I did use it and I would want to explain, but what readers, I think, you know, they don't really care when we get angry or if we laugh or cry. The, the challenge as a storyteller is to get them anger, angry by themselves, you know, to let them find their own way. Um, and that's for me is the power of story. But yeah, you're right, not everybody is, um, you know, there's this kind of old adage out there that everybody's got a story to tell. Um, and I would take issue with that. I think some people's stories are more interesting than others and some people are better storytellers than others. And, you know, what I'm looking for, I'm looking for people, first of all, I want to spend time with, because I assume if I don't want to spend time with them, my readers aren't going to want to spend time with them. And then I'm looking for stories or journeys or experiences that surprise me in one manner or another, um, that kind of upend what I thought I knew. And again, it's what I hope to do with readers as well, is to get them thinking differently about the world around them. Uh, 
but one of the things that's really important for me when I find someone who I'm interested in writing about is that they have some level, it doesn't have to be big, but some level of self-awareness, that there, there's some introspr introspection. Um, uh, that's so, you know, to, to, I don't want to get stuck on your first book, but it's probably your best known book. There are no children here and Oprah selection, you know, huge bestseller. I mean, how did you find the two boys that you wrote about? Yeah, well, in some ways by accident, which is often how it happens. Um, I was asked initially by Chicago Magazine was doing a photo essay on children growing up in poverty in Chicago, again, on the heels of this Children's Defense Fund report. And they had a photographer come in from New York and asked if I would go out and meet with the kids he was photographing and if I wouldn't just do a, like a one paragraph account of each of the children. And one of the boys was Lafayette. And that was my first time in public housing. And again, I was really upended by what I saw and what I heard. And that one day I was there and I had lost touch with Lafayette, but I was haunted by the afternoon. And so a couple of years later, I decided to go back. I, I, I went and spent uh, three weeks hanging out at the boys, what was in the boys club, now the boys and girls club, you know, just playing basketball, shooting pool with kids after school, getting, meeting people. And then I ran into Lafayette. Um, he remembered me. I didn't remember him. He remembered me. And then, um, and uh, to be honest, there was a part of me that identified with Lafayette where he was, he wasn't in the oldest brother in that family, but he was an older brother to Pharaoh. And I was, uh, I'm the older of two brothers. And I know as an older child, you often feel a sense of responsibility. And Lafayette really felt a sense of responsibility for Pharaoh. Um, and so I, ident I identified with Lafayette in some way, um, and we just connected. And then of course I met Pharaoh and the thing I loved about the two of them is that they were, you know, deeply in love with each other, but yet they couldn't have been more different. Um, so just for people who haven't read the book, give me, give me the book jacket. <laughs> yeah. So the book, you know, it's a very kind of simple conceit. I spent two years, I followed uh, these two boys growing up in poverty in what's the world's most prosperous country. Um, uh, I spent two years with them chronicling uh, their lives uh, and their struggles. Um, so it was about the, you know, dec decrepit, neglectful housing conditions. It was about the violence that they had to contend with. Um, it was about uh, under-resourced school, about all the things I think we know all too well that bear down on people growing up in poverty. Um, and, and of course, it was a community um, that was entirely black uh, and not by accident. You know, you sort of, a part of the book looks at the history of these neighborhoods, uh, especially public housing, and you come to realize that this, the segregation we experienced in Chicago and elsewhere, of course, is, was, was purposeful. You know, when you write about anybody, you take their lives in your hands. Yeah. It is a very fraught, experience at least if you're paying attention it should be a fraud experience yeah. right if it's not a fraud experience you're not doing right. it right yeah right um and being written about also changes something not only for you the writer but it changes something for the people that you're writing about H how do you feel that lafayette's and pharaoh's lives changed as a result you know it's a good question they were so young um it's, it's hard to know. I think one of the you know, things I always worry about with people, I, well, there are a lot of things I worry about. I, you know, I wanna make sure that I, 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 I capture them in a way that feels honest and accurate and fair um, and also affirming to who they are. And one of the things I have to remind myself when I'm writing about people is I'm usually writing out of them because I admire them on some level and so, uh, and that readers will get that. And so it's important not to pull my punches. In other words, to sort of try to capture people in all their complexities and richness and fullness. Um, and then, you know, you, you worry about sort of, so you write this thing for you know, this very public display and you wonder and sometimes worry about what the response is gonna be. You know, I worry about it as a writer and I know people I write about worry about it as, subjects as people being written about. Um, I, you know, I don't know 
you know, the, it opened up some opportunities for Lafayette and Farrow. I think um, uh, I used, um, I made a unilateral decision with that book. I changed their last name in the book. I just felt they were young enough that they needed to make a decision down the road whether they wanted to identify with the book. And they do, they embrace it. Um, but um, that's a hard question. I don't know fully. I mean, it's been a struggle for them. I don't want to talk too much publicly about them, but they're, you know, I'm still very much in touch with them, you know, some 30 years later. Um, and I know there are things they're really proud about the book. And they're also, you know, there were people who were jealous about all the attention they got in this immediate publication. You know, from, from that book, you know, a, a different writer might have gone on to a completely different topic, you know, climate change or something. But, but you have stuck with this theme yeah. for, you know, these 30 some odd years. Um, talk to me a little bit about, I don't know if that was a decision or just something that flowed naturally for you. Why have you stuck with this? Yeah, well, I can tell you like my second book, The Other Side of the River is a book specifically about race. And I wrote that in some ways because I, after I emerged from There Are No Children Here and was speaking about it around the country, I realized, um, of course, the lives of those two boys had everything to do with race. And, never, and yet I never really, if I'm honest, never really dealt with it in a really forthright manner in There Are No Children Here. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to try to find a way to write about race in a much more straight ahead, um, pointed way. And so that's what led me to the other side of the river. You know, it's funny, Mary, I mean, I, there are times where I find myself, you know, I, I mean, I have other interests and there are times that I find myself you know, writing about other things, but I'm always brought back um, to this kind of intersection of race and poverty in this country because it hasn't gone away. I mean, I think for me, I mean, you know this as well as I do, one of the things that's so sobering is in some ways how little things have, have changed. Um, and, uh, and so you kind of feel like you need, you know, need to keep on shouting or in my case, keep on telling stories. Can I read your paragraph that you wrote in uh, your most recent book, An sure. American Summer, which chronicles the violent summer in Chicago in, in 2013. The shooting doesn't end, nor does the grinding poverty or the deeply rooted segregation or the easy availability of guns or the shuttered schools and boarded up homes, or the tensions between police and residents. And yet each shooting is unlike the last. Every exposed and bruised life, exposed and bruised in its own way. Everything and nothing remains the same. And you could have written that this morning. Right, right. No, and in fact, uh, the, you know, when I wrote that, when that book came out just a couple of years ago, but the book, you know, takes place over the course of one summer in Chicago, 2013, which actually was a reasonably good year in terms of uh, violence in the city. And of course, now the numbers have almost doubled since then. Um, and I wrote that book in large part because I feel like for so much of Chicago, and I could have, I wanna be clear, I could have written this book in so many other cities, Baltimore, New Orleans, Philadelphia, Washington, Detroit. I wrote about Chicago because the city I know, it's my city. Um, and it's, I think so, these neighborhoods that I write about, these neighborhoods that are deeply distressed and have been for decades um, are so profoundly isolated from the rest of the city that it's, so easy for the rest of us to turn our heads um, and to look away. And yet, um, I think we've completely sort of underestimated the impact, uh, as I alluded to in that part you read, that we've, uh, you know, that we've underestimated the impact that that violence has on both the spirit of individuals and the spirit of community. And so this book in some ways was to put a face on it, to humanize the people who in one manner or another have been touched by the violence. Um, 
And I think that's probably the case with all my books is, is you know, each of my books is these very kind of intimate portraits. Um, uh, you know, these kind of, in some ways, really small stories that are about something much, much larger. Well, one thing that distinguishes you as a writer is that you are a writer who's also branched into other modes of storytelling. I mean, I think you've written a play, uh, you've done a podcast, and most famously, you've worked with Steve James, a great documentarian on a couple of films that he has done based on your original work. So most recently, City So Real, and before that, uh, The Interrupters. Right. Um, so how has that work been different for you? Or has it accomplished anything different? Right. So I want to just say City So Real, while it shares the, the, the title of one of my books, it really was, that, that film was really Steve's invention. I was an executive producer on it. And in some ways, nothing more than a glorified consultant. Um, uh, and, um, but The Interrupters was very much a collaborative experience for us. Yeah, I love, you know, I do, I've been doing radio for, since I began working as a journalist, uh, since the 1980s and the early years of NPR. Um, I was living again in Michigan and it was just during this really deep industrial recession when all the auto companies were asking for concessions from our workers, from its workers. And NPR was desperate to have somebody out there and they, they actually taught me radio over the phone. Um, and, uh, uh, and I spent a lot of time writing about Flint. In fact, worked uh, with Michael Moore up there when he was publishing his paper, The Flint Voice. Um, but I love radio. I mean, radio is just, just is, there's an immediate, talk about an intimate medium. I mean, you know, there's something so visceral about radio. Um, and the other thing about, you know, contributing to a place like This American Life, you've got this incredibly loyal, audience. Um, and then I've done film and I, you know, started by doing documentary work for PBS back in the 1980s. Um, and I love TV and film, but I probably love it more as a consumer than I do as a creator. I find I've, it's interesting when we were working on the interrupters, we, I'd go into the edit room and if I'm working on a book, I, I can hold the whole book in my head um, or even or a radio piece. But I'd go in and I'd we'd be editing a scene and I'd have to be reminded of what preceded that scene and what followed. I couldn't, I'm just not wired, I suppose, in the way that I should be to do film. But I love it as a medium because it's so accessible. Um, and when it's, when it's operating on all cylinders, it can be so damn powerful. Um, in, in, in everything that you do, it seems that you get very close to the people that you are writing about or filming. And that can be very tricky, right? Yeah, it can. I, I got to say, I think of it as one of the perks about what I do, that my life and my family's life, I feel like it's so much richer because of the people I've met, the stories I've done. I mean, I remember at our wedding, you know, uh, 30 years ago, probably there probably were a dozen people there at least who were people I'd written about, um, you know, who I met over the course of writing. I think what gets tricky, and maybe this is what you're alluding to, is that, um, you know, when I sit down to, after I spend months, sometimes years with people, and I sit down again to put pen to paper, I need to remind myself that I'm writing not for them, but I'm writing for my readers. And so I actually, will tell people, you know, I spent a lot of time with them. I tell them I'm going to kind of disappear for a while. Um, and I actually put some physical distance just to remind myself. And then once I'm done, I go back and revisit with them what I've written. You know, one of the things that's important to me and I don't succeed all the time is that they're, they're really the people I write about. There shouldn't be any surprises. Um, and uh, oh, yeah. but, what? Yeah. No, I, I completely agree yeah. on that. And I don't, you know, I, I think there are some journalists who don't agree with that. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, yeah, P I mean, I'm writing about, for the most part, people who are not public figures. They've got no obligation to talk to me. I want to be clear that the ground rules for public officials is very different. Right. Um, but I feel, I mean, they, I'm asking them to open up to me. Uh, and I feel that it's really important uh, that they be proud in the end of what 
I've written, what I've had to say about them. And, and that's, you know, 98% of the time. There are times when there are people who, you know, are much more complicated than they imagine themselves. But, um, uh, but it is hard. I do, you know, I worry about my, what my readers are going to think, but I really worry about what the people I've written about are going to think. Uh, well, you know, you write in the introduction to An American Summer about how Pharaoh, from There Are No Children Here, came to live with you. Right. right. And eventually with you and your wife. Right. And, right. you know, that's a very intimate. Um, yeah, and, uh, and unusual. I, mean, I, I recognize that. Yeah, and I honestly had not really talked about it publicly until I wrote about it. Yeah. An American summer and still feel a little uncomfortable talking about it only because I feel like it's not my place uh, now to sort of talk about Farrell publicly, you know, when I was with him working on the book. But he did. He lived with us uh, for, uh, you know, for the bulk of his adolescence. And uh, um, and it's one of, you know, many relationships that have come out of my and my work. And again, I just it's one of the things I love about what I do. Um, I think left to my own devices, and I don't know if you're this way, but I think if I left to my own devices, I'd probably just hole up in my office in my house and never come out, you know. And so, it's so uh, this work pushes you out into the world. It just right. forces you to, right. to uh, cross boundaries and gives you a license to do that as well. Right. Um, you know, in in these decades that you've been doing this. So much hasn't changed, and yet some things have changed. In Chicago, um, I want to say the nature of the violence, that's not quite right, but, but what, what is your sense of, of how these problems that are chronic and deep have changed and haven't changed? So, look, one of the things that's changed uh, in Chicago and cities across the country is the is the raising of public housing. You know, public housing on the one hand was this grand notion that we were going to provide affordable housing for people who could least afford it. Um, and yet, of course, when it was built, it was built on the cheap. It was in Chicago in particular, it was built to the edge of already existing black ghettos and served as a kind of bulwark to segregation. Uh, they were completely neglected. Um, and so there was a lot to cheer about. Um, I think uh, as often happens you, uh, uh, in Chicago and elsewhere, you have this moment of celebration and, there's, and then this moment to bemoan because, of course, we tore down all of public housing and really had no plans for people who were living there. And so, so many of them scattered to the winds. Um, and it was also this moment when I thought, well, maybe for the first time, the city will really sort of talk in a really substantive way about integrating the neighborhoods in the city. And of course, there was no conversation about that. So I always feel like we kind of take a step forward and then there's a half step backward. Like I even think about it when I arrived in the city, Mary, and you were here, you were here at Harold Washington's election, right? Uh, I was actually down covering the South for, yes. uh, for the trip in Atlanta, but okay. so affiliated. Right, but I came here right on the heels of Washington's election. And Oh my God, there's so much to celebrate. I mean, here for the city elected its first black mayor in this incredibly broad coalition, um, a progressive individual who really saw the fissures in the landscape and was planning to address it. And then on the other hand, he gets elected and these 29 white aldermen who can't stand the idea of a black man running their city vote against everything that Harold proposes. And so again, you kind of take the step forward and then this half step backward. And I feel like we do that with so much. Um, I think for me, one of the things, the reason I wrote about the violence in an American summer is because it's been so stubborn and so persistent. And there are these moments when we feel like we've figured it out. And um, in fact, I remember the review in the New York Times of my book, one of the things that the reviewer said is, you know, why is Kotlowitz, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but why is Kotlowitz writing about this book? It's not really much of a problem anymore. And you know, here we are this last year with almost 800 homicides and we're on pace now to exceed that this year. Um, but what, what, uh, is, what, is, what is different 
about the, the structure of the violence or the impetus for the violence. Right. So here's the big difference is that back in the nine, late 1980s and 1990s, when the numbers were off the charts, you know, when I was writing there on our children here, I think there were over 900 homicides in the city. Um, and most of it was over drug turf. It was really kind of a, a financially driven violence. You know, these efforts of these gangs to hold on. It was when crack had just come into the city. Um, and it was really all about terrain, about holding on to their franchises. Um, and if you talk to the old timer, the old gang members, um, they have a romantic view of what happen. They just said, you know, back then, you know, at least we had control over, you know, people. But I point out to them, it may have been the case, but the violence was was sky high. What's changed is, you know, those gangs have been broken up. And so now much of the violence is really interpersonal. Um, I hesitate to use the word petty because that somehow diminishes what takes place. But they're often over arguments over, you know, uh, uh, someone talking to a girlfriend or maybe a, um, uh, someone breaking into lo a line. Um, and there are now those gangs have broken apart um, and there are you know, hundreds of these small factions that are really organized block by block. Um, the other thing that has changed, um, and I don't know the answer, reason for this, and I think it's a really, it's a, it's a, if I were the, superintendent of the police would be the single most question I'd want to answer. You know, back when the violence was so high in the early 90s, the police had a pretty high closure rate. They were pretty good about solving violent crimes. They're miserable at it at the moment. Uh, we had, I think, 3,000 shootings last year in which people were wounded, and only 10% of those shootings were those cases closed. Um, for Why the do you think that is? I don't, Mary, I don't fully know. I mean, I, you know, I, I what you'll hear from detectives is, you know, it's because people won't cooperate. And there's some truth to that. Uh, but though I think that, you know, often the detectives will tell you that the reason people don't want to cooperate is because of this so-called no snitching culture. But the truth of the matter is people don't want to cooperate. And this is the vicious cycle is because they don't feel safe and they don't feel like the police can protect them because they can't solve the crimes. And so that inability to solve crimes, I think makes it harder to, for the police to get to talk to witnesses uh, to violent acts. Um, and so, you know, and, and yet we're unable to solve these violent crimes and we crack down on all these small petty crimes, you know, until the ACU, ACLU intervened, you know, there were thousands of stops of mainly young people of color in this city by the police who would just stop people. I mean, I would see it time and time again when I was spending time in these neighborhoods, they would just stop kids coming home from school, you know, and kind of interrogate them and body search them. Um, and yet they were unable to do what I think is the most, one of their most important jobs. Um, which is to solve crimes. Um, uh, Chicago's not alone, but we I will tell you that we're one of the worst in terms of closure rates in the country. Okay. Um, obviously, you are a white person. And you're a white person who had spent all of these years chronicling the lives of people who are not white. And I just wonder how you're feeling about that and your place in the storytelling universe and they have evolved right. through these years. You know, we are, we are in a different time now, a different right. sensibility, different sense of, of what race means and who should and could be telling the stories of people who are not white. Right. No, there's this really vital conversation taking place and it's an important conversation, but here's, here's my thinking about it and it's, it's evolving, but um, I have a number of thoughts. I mean, one, given, you know, Mary, what you and I do, we're, we're, we go out into the world and just by the nature of our work, we're outsiders, you know, if not by race and class, by geography or religion or politics, it's just the, it's the nature of 
this business. It's the nature of being a journalist, of, of writing nonfiction. Um, and there are advantages and disadvantages to being an outsider. The disadvantage, of course, is you don't know the culture. You haven't experienced what those you're writing about have experienced, but there are advantages. You come in with a fresh set of eyes. You sometimes ask questions that people have stopped asking. Um, and so I think it's really important um, that white journalists spend time in communities other than their own um, and write about people who don't necessarily look like them. Um, uh, it seems to be really essential. I think the real question is, and you know, people can ask that of my work, have you done it in a way that is honor, honors the authenticity and the truthfulness of what is out there? Have you done it in a way that captures the spirit of the people you're writing about? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, I, the flip side of this is I gotta tell you is I, given all that I see and all that I hear, I mean, my other choice is to remain silent and to remain silent for me seems complicit. Um, I don't know that I could live with myself um, if I did that. Um, and so, so I think it's important that we spend time in communities other than our own. Uh, the other, the final thought I will say is that, you know, when I was working on an American summer, I had this experience where I was invited to Stateville Prison, a maximum security prison near Joliet, to uh, uh, give a workshop on storytelling to the inmates there, um, most of them in their 40s and 50s, all in for violent offenses. And I had them do this really quick exercise to write about their prison cells. And I was so taken with what they wrote that I spent, offered to spend time with them working and refining these essays. And one of them wrote about learning how to play the piano in his prison cell. He built a cardboard piano and played the music. He heard the music in his head. He got to play a real piano one Sunday every week. Uh, there was another one about who was a recluse, about what it meant to be a recluse in prison. So I worked with these guys for 10 months. They were beautiful, beautiful essays. You know, we got some of them published in the New Yorker. We hired actors to read them and do them as a podcast. And it was something I so enjoyed, and it made me think that one of the things I'd like to do um, it, it more of is not only tell other people's stories, but also find ways, as I did with these guys, to give them the tools to tell their own stories. That feels to me also really yeah. important. You know, uh, another thing that I sense has changed recently among reporters, that there's a lot more discussion among journalists who cover complicated situations, whether it's violence or COVID, about the effect that it has on journalists. This feels new to me. I don't remember journalists ever talking about this before. And I honestly don't quite know what to make of it. Um, but it does take a toll. It can, or it certainly can. Let's, let's yeah. say that. It can take a toll. And I just wonder if, you know, immersing yourself so much for so long in these difficult aspects of life has ever just left you depressed. I mean, just, just this feeling of, oh my God, we're never gonna get out of this. Yeah, it's not so much that it's, it's not this kind of um, meta um, or, or uh, depression, but it's it's very personal. And I, I will tell you what I experienced working on, on this American summer. You know, I was talking about people about, for the most part, about the most tragic and painful day in their lives. And I remember when I had finished most of the reporting and was beginning to write, I um, had this experience, which I'd never had before. I was visiting friends in Seattle and I was just, I couldn't, I, I felt, unable to experience, I couldn't experience any sense of joy. I had trouble smiling. I just wanted to be by myself. And I realized, I mean, I went to see a counselor when I got home, um, you know, that I was experiencing, I think what you were describing, which is kind of secondary or vicarious trauma. Um, and, um, and there's no question, I think that for, you know, that it, for many of us in our profession who are writing about issues that are profoundly painful um, and traumatic, that it's very likely that you may experience some of that trauma yourself. Um, I gotta say though, the thing that keeps me going in the end, and I don't mean to sound glib about this, but 
the people I spend time with. I mean, I just, I think about the people I met during the course of an American summer. And despite all the pain and all the trauma they've experienced, each of them in their own ways is just kind of pushing on. Um, some of them tentatively, but some of them heroically. And uh, it's, uh, um, again, I don't mean to sound glib about this, but there's something really inspiring about it, certainly exhilarating about it. Um, you know, many of those people I'm still friends with and I will, when I'm having a tough time or the other side will we'll call and talk. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I think writing about this, you know, um, and again, I don't think of myself as an angry person. I, I think writing about race and poverty in this country has made me angrier. And, and these last four years, especially, you know, uh, were, were difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, you also teach, so these, you know, these things that you've learned, these values that you hold mm -hmm. are something that you're transferring to young people now. So tell me two or three things that students who study with you, you hope will come away with. Well, I hope they'll come away with a really deep respect for the often fierce power of narrative, of storytelling. You know, I just pound that away with my students that how important it is to find a story and that, and to be ambitious, but, um, but being ambitious doesn't mean that say you're writing about the violence in Chicago, that you kind of go and talk to everybody you can, but you find these really small intimate stories. I think of it as a kind of bigness of the small story. Um, and um, and then the other thing I hope they come away with is to, this understanding and uh, acknowledgement that they it's okay to build relationships in the course of your reporting that that's sort of it's part and parcel of what we're involved in um, and I think as you said earlier I mean if we're not if if we're not thinking about that if we're not building those relationships something's not working. Um, what are some things that you may find yourself arguing with students about where, where you sense that there may be some generational shift here about how to approach stories, how to approach journalism? I think one of the things I wrestle with is my students will often, I, I will sometimes hear from students, it, mainly in their anonymous critiques at the end of the class, that a college just wants us to get us all to write like him. And um, and what I tell them is, and I'm very upfront about this at the beginning of class, is that one, I'm going to pare their writing down, just strip it bare so that they can build it back up and that they will find their own style. And also uh, the other two things uh, is, um, you know, they're all so eager to find their voice. And I tell them they're going to find their voice, not in their writing, but in their reporting and what they choose to write about and the depths of their reporting. Um, and that in the end, we don't really care about them. I mean, they, if, they're, if they're in a story, we sh shouldn't or don't really care to know about them. Um, but uh, I think the hardest thing, honestly, Mary, and you know this as well as I do, is the landscape for our profession has changed so dramatically over the past 10 years. I, I was about to get to that. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, this is a good segue, but everybody's so worried. Weather about journalism, this. Alex. Everybody's finding a place to land, you know, and, you know, you and I have talked about this, but, you know, I'm so profoundly worried about the, the, the what I see is the kind of slow dripping away um, uh, um, destruction of local journalism. You know, I don't know how we have a democracy where we don't have a vital, robust press. And the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, they're not only gonna survive, they're gonna thrive, but, but it's everywhere else. And of course, you know, we see it here in our own city and your paper, which is about to be purchased by a, a hedge fund, the notorious for stripping newspapers of the most value resource, which is the reporters. Um, I, I just don't know, I, I, I don't understand how this democracy will not 
begin to sort of crumble um, if we can ensure that we've got this a robust press in all our cities and towns. Um, that just seems so essential. Um, um, and I'm actually kind of surprised at the lack of concern. I mean, we see it again here in Chicago, you know, that no civic leader stepped up to try to rescue the Tribune. Um, if it had been the Art Institute that was fall, falling under, I think people would have been stepping over themselves to Maybe there's some 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 uh, good-hearted, civic-minded billionaires who are who are on this Zoom. <laughs> you still you still have about ten days, my friends. <laughs> um, I know we're going to open this up to to questions in a moment. Um, but before we get to that, what what would you like people who are here tonight for this fireside chat to leave? thinking about? Well, I guess, um, you know, given what I write about, much of what I write about, um, I think it's the two, my, outside of what's happening to local journalism, my other two big concerns in this country is the growing economic divide, um, uh, where, um, uh, and you see this profoundly in our city of Chicago. Um, and also uh, this, this uh, uh, to sort of underscore that race still very much matters here in America. I mean, those, those are two subjects I've been writing, but I wrote about when I began in this profession and I will continue to write about um, because they still, I think the, especially race is, it's, it's the most, uh, profound fissure in the American landscape. Um, and Before we get to questions, let me ask you one, one more question. If you were going to recommend one book to help people understand race in this country that is not a book of yours, what would you recommend? Book about race that I would recommend. God, there's so much wonderful stuff out there. Um, so, um, well, the two books that come most immediate to mind, but there's so many. Um, one most recently is Isabel Wilkerson's Cast, which I is a really must read. And and I'm not I'm not entirely convinced that we need another lens through which to look at race. But the beauty of that book is it it still reminds us why race still so much matters. And I think for me, one of the most chilling things about that book is the section when Isabel writes about how. Uh, Nazi Germany used Jim Crow uh, as its kind of blueprint, um, uh, relied on it uh, to create um, the uh, Nazi Germany. Um, and the other book that I would go back to is uh, Tony Lucas's uh, Common Ground, mm -hmm. which was written in the 1970s about the busing crisis in Boston from three different perspectives. It's a beautiful piece of work, a beautiful piece of writing. Um, but it's also, um, I mean, a book that I think still resonates today. Great. Well, um, I see Patrick is back with us. So Patrick, are you gonna um, read some questions from the, from the I chat? I gotta say, Mary, this has been so much fun. I just, uh, thanks for, uh, oh, yes. so I mean, I, it's, no, you ask me stuff I don't get asked a lot. And so oh, I- Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> I feel I feel I feel my journalism cred has been redeemed. <laughs> oh come on, you don't need me to give you journalism cred, but yeah, I just, thanks. Thank you. So Patrick, it's all you yeah. now. Yeah, that was great. I mean, I that was a, a great conversation. So thank you for that. Um, you uh, you did answer preemptively some of the questions that were submitted in advance, but I still have a lot of questions here. Um, uh, Alex, uh, you were quoted in the Tribune as saying that empathy is the centrifugal force for both storytelling and communities. Um, what did you mean by that? Right, so let me be clear about what I mean by empathy um, because it's very different from sympathy, which is feeling sorry for someone or taking pity on them. And empathy is all about this ability to imagine yourself as someone else, you know, to put yourself in the proverbial shoes of someone else. To be able to look at the world through their eyes, not to 
<clears throat> excuse them for what they've done or not to justify what they've done, but rather to come to understand why people make the choices they do. Um, and, um, and so storytelling, it's, it's essential to any good story. I mean, this notion of empathy, this ability of the reader to kind of, it, fiction and nonfiction, to stand in the shoes of the people you're reading, you sort of begin to experience it along with them. But it's also the central force of community. It's what holds us together. And God knows these last four years, we are a country that has really lacked empathy, especially from the very top. Um, but empathy is so critical to community. I remember when Obama was running uh, his first campaign in 2007, um, he would go out on the stump early on and talk about the empathy gap. I think he stopped talking about it because I think he figured nobody will know, you know, eyes were rolling, nobody quite knew what he was talking about. But what he was basically saying is that we've got to find a way to imagine ourselves as each other, uh, especially in this country. You know, the, the great paradox in this country is we like to think we're all in it together. And yet we lead such disparate lives. You know, we live with people who look like us, who sound like us, who think like us. And so it takes a real effort, um, both physically and spiritually, to spend time with people other than your own. Um, so. Great. Um, oh, really quick, we did have a request. Uh, what were the two books that you had mentioned just prior to that question? Sure, I mentioned Isabel Wilkerson's cast and Anthony Lucas's, J. Anthony Lucas's book, Common Ground. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let's see here. Um, is there any basis for hope for Chicago's future? Well, look, I, I'm a naturally, I'm not, I'm not necessarily a natural optimist, but, but hope is, well, first of all, to tell stories, you gotta have hope. I mean, it's a very, you know, the very act of storytelling is an act of, of hope. So am I hopeful? Yeah, I mean, there are things to be hopeful about. Um, uh, you know, I think just growing activism uh, um, in these past six months in Chicago and elsewhere has been uh, exhilarating. Um, and it's been activism not only from people in the black and Latino communities who know from experience what it's like to be a person of color, but it's also activism from the white community as well. Um, um, I think, uh, you know, I'm excited about what our new president has um, begun to propose and, and, um, and really trying to find ways to fortify children and families and communities. Um, uh, so there, there are reasons to be hopeful, um, but again, I sometimes think with every step forward, we take a step back. You know, I think the thing to remind us, especially when it comes to race, we've just had a president for four years who trafficked in racist and anti-immigrant rhetoric, and those in his party and those around him were unable or unwilling to stand up to him um, and, um, and were complicit in their silence. Um, and we need to remind ourselves that 70 million people voted for them. And so for me, the real question is, how do we reach those individuals? Um, <clears throat> what would you like to see the city focus on to combat um, community-wide trauma? So I think, you know, it's one of the encouraging things in the violence prevention field in recent years is this kind of reckoning with trauma, the, re the recognition that, that we've got to find a way to deal with the trauma of individuals and communities. And so there are some incredible programs. In fact, one of the most inventive violence prevention programs in the country is taking place here in Chicago it's called Ready. Chicago at a Heartland Alliance run by Eddie Bocanegra, one of the people, in fact, I wrote about in An American Summer. And, you know, the program, you know, it's kind of, some of it's a kind of simple idea, but, you know, they, they work with young men, men, young men who are, are for one reason or another likely to be involved in the violence in the city. And they provide jobs, which is nothing new, uh, provide employment, the work is really important to a sense of self, a sense of identity. 
But the other thing they do is that they're required to participate in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, in this case, in group therapy to, to really begin to sort of grapple with the trauma of what they've experienced. And, and Ready Chicago is not the only organization out there doing this, but it is one of the most inventive ones. Um, so uh, it's, it, uh, there's a great program in Philadelphia called uh, Healing Hurt People run by an uh, emergency room doctor, Ted Corbett, who, who, and what they do is they work with young men who have been shot and who undergo intensive counseling. Um, and I've talked to some of those young men and I got to say, they are so self-aware of what they've been through. Um, it's like talking to a, a veteran having returned from combat in Afghanistan and Iraq who's undergone counseling and therapy. I mean, that equal sense of self. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of a re related question and it refers to the documentary you did. Um, have the interrupters done well in their lives? I know you just mentioned Eddie. I think he was in the interrupters. Uh, have you kept in touch with the other ones? Have they done oh, yeah, well? No, yeah, so they're, you know, the film revolves around three individuals, three violence interrupters, Eddie Bocanegra, Amina Matthews, and Kobe Williams. And, and they're all doing really well. Eddie is, you know, he's running this program. He, he if you remember the film, there's this, a uh, beautiful social worker and he they end up getting married after the film came out and they're now uh, expecting their seventh child and Catherine is a, now a professor at Jane Addams School of Social Work. Um, they're remarkable. Kobe's still working with C Cure Violence, you know, which was formerly Ceasefire and, uh, and, and Amina is still active on the South Side, just doing amazing work. She in fact ran for Congress against Bobby Rush. So yeah, they're all doing remarkable work. I, I just have so much admiration for the three of them. That was one of the most enjoyable projects to work on in large part because of, of Eddie, Amina, and Colby. Yeah, it was a great, it was a great documentary. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, um, here's one about your writing. Um, how do you manage to write in such an earnest and non-didactic manner? I find that I read your work with the same enthusiasm of reading fiction. Okay. Uh, well, thanks. I'm not sure I would describe my writing as earnest, uh, though I may be earnest, um, but, uh, um, but thanks. I mean, I think the challenge, you know, I, look, I read more fiction than I do nonfiction. And, you know, there's a, many people have different monikers for this craft, you know, creative nonfiction, literary nonfiction, but I like, what I like most is the way John McPhee, the New Yorker writer describes it, which is the literature of fact, which is trying to create literature out of fact. And I know it doesn't sound very sexy, it's very, it sounds very prosaic, but it's really what we're trying to do is, you know, take all the tools of novelists um, and write with the same flair and verve and sense of story. Um, and yet knowing that what we're writing about, and this is the never to be chiseled dictum in our craft is that everything we write about has got to be verifiable. Um, it's got to be true. It's got to be authentic. Um, so, but I appreciate that. I mean, I'm glad to hear that it reads like fiction. Um, and in fact, the book that inspired me was Tony Lucas's Common Ground. I read that book, I remember, and I thought, damn, I want to do this. <laughs> uh, um, who do you write for? Who, who is your target audience? You know, I get asked this a lot and I, I'm not sure I have a really clear answer for this. I guess, you know, in the end I'm writing um, for people who might not have reason to spend time with the people I'm writing about, um, that, they, uh, that they might not be a part of their lives. Um, but having said that, I gotta say that one of the most rewarding things, uh, reactions to my books is often what I hear from people who read my stories and it kind of affirms their own experiences. You know, and people will just come up and say, thank you for telling my story. Um, but I suppose in the end, when I'm sitting down to write, I'm imagining people um, who wouldn't have reason to spend time in the communities that I'm spending time in. Um, here's a question for both Alex and Mary. Who are your favorite fiction writers? Mary, do you wanna? You know, I, I have real trouble answering that question. 
I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of Alice Munro and her short stories, so I don't generally love short stories. It's easier for me to say, to name three books that I've loved lately, and I will name them. Deacon King Kong by James McBride. This is Happiness by Niall Williams. And The Overstory by Richard Powers. Right. Alex, what about you? Yeah, I think I have a hard time too. I was just making a note to myself to think about I mean, it's really, it's all, you know, the, the writers who I feel like I've discovered in recent years are the writers that I think most about at the moment. So I just discovered this novelist uh, last summer, Andrew Krivak, um, who's written three books, The Bear, Sojourn, and um, The Signal Flame. Um, and he's just a beautiful writer um, out of Boston. Uh, uh, Jasmine Ward, I would read anything Jasmine Ward. Right, I mean, her work is just remarkable. Talk about empathy. Oh my God, I just, um, uh, and uh, um, and then there's a writer, Howard Norman, whose work I love is kind of very quiet novelist, um, quiet writer, I should say, um, whose work I, I love. <clears throat> um, Alex, how did you become interested in education? And ad in addition to, um, you know, writing books and, um, how, how did you wind up teaching journalism at Northwestern University? Yeah, I mean, in part by accident, I, you know, was asked uh, 20 years ago to come teach a class at Northwestern and I ended up staying and I, you know, um, I love it. I mean, it's been, you know, times I feel conflicted because it does compete with my own time to do my own work, um, but I love my students. Um, and I've been doing it now long enough and this is what I didn't quite expect is that, you know, there are many of those students that become a part of my life, you know, and I'm just really, I feel like a proud parent. I have to be careful with them. I'll sometimes email them. I'll say, I know it's not my place, but I'm so damn proud of what you've just done. You know, students who've gone to write books, who are professors, who uh, um, work for magazines. Uh, it's, that's been just so rewarding. Um, and, uh, and I love to, you know, one of the things I just love, and we, you know, I teach in a quarter system, so it's not a lot of time, but you often see a lot of growth just in those 10 weeks. Uh, and I sometimes will tell them, you should go back and take a look at the first thing you did in this class. Uh, cool. Um, has your readership or audience size changed or, or shrunk with the rise of uh, digital media? Um, well, I don't know that digital media is what competes with me because, you know, my books are available on Kindle or, you know, audio, they're available on audio. Um, you know, the book business is still pretty, and surprisingly, but pretty, still pretty vital, which is really encouraging. Um, and I was really concerned for a while there that the book business was really going to shrink, um, but people are still reading. And, you know, book sales during the pandemic were actually pretty high. I was just talking to my agent the other day. I think his concern is that they're going to begin to drop off again. But um, so I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that there's still a lot of readers out there. Um, and, you know, I, the, the thing, the, the, the new kid on the block, is really is podcasts. Um, and I don't know that they compete with books, um, but I do think some of the most original and imaginative nonfiction storytelling is taking place on podcasts. Cool. Okay, um, <clears throat> here's one that came in through the chat. It um, says, how does Alex explain why he was uh, accepted and often protected by many of the gangs in the city? Well, it's, you know, I, I, look, one, one thing is I spend a lot of time with people and I, I want to be clear, I don't walk into communities um, and just simply walk down the street and introduce myself, hey, I'm Alex Kotlowitz. And because I can tell you that, you know, nine times out of 10 people are going to say, you know, I really have no interest in talking to you. I don't know who you are. Um, and so what I do is, you know, I look for people or institutions that have some respect and dignity who are kind of my guides. And so The Interrupters, the film is actually a really good example. You know, the access we got in those communities had everything to do with Kobe, Eddie, and Amina. I mean, once we won their trust, they were our portals into these, into these neighborhoods. We never would have had the access had, had it not been 
for them. Um, and that's the case with all my books with, there are no children here. You know, I mentioned, I spent time at the boys club. Well, Major Adams who ran that club, he took me around. And one of the things unbeknownst to me at the time was introduced me to the gang leaders there and told them who I was and just said, you know, keep an eye out for them. And, and you know, they did. It was, you know, I wasn't a threat um, to them, but, but it's, it has everything to do with building relationships and building trust. Uh, and one of the things that's important to me is I'm asking people to be honest and open with me. And I feel it's, it's equally important that I be as open and honest as I can with them as well. Okay. Um, well, that is all the questions that I um, have um, for you. Um, I really enjoyed, um, I mean, just, listening to you guys talk. Mary, yeah, those are some great questions. Um, and I think that kind of, that concludes our program tonight. I think Ryan is gonna share the links to where uh, people can buy your books again in the chat really quick. And- um, Patrick, can I just give a quick shout out to libraries? Cause you- Oh guys, yeah. Oh my God, that's, I'm sure like Mary, it's right. It was my refuge as a, at Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I'm a, my library on 83rd Street and Amsterdam Avenue. And I remember coming out of that library down those cement steps, you know, with the, we were allowed, I think, six books at a time back then. And uh, it was my it was my license into, the, you know, my entree into the world. Um, so anyway, just thanks for all the work you guys do. Well, my yeah. library in Macon, Georgia, the great refuge after school. Huh. That's very, very nice to hear. You're welcome. <laughs> um, okay, well, um, um, thank you again very much. Um, I want to thank everybody who participated and just remind everybody to respond to uh, the survey um, when we close the event momentarily. Um, so thanks again. It was good talking Patrick, with you guys. Thank you, Alex, for right. making it fun and yes. easy and informative and to everybody who came. That was right. Right. Yeah, this was wonderful. Yeah. Great. Okay. All right. Thanks. Have a good evening. Thanks. Thank yeah. you all. Thanks. Okay.